We are continuing with Consilience by Edward O. Wilson. In the previous chapter, he was talking about the Enlightenment and how much he thinks of it as pretty good, better than pretty good. In point of fact, Professor Wilson is talking about how much the Enlightenment helped the natural sciences. And it somewhat divided knowledge, which is what he's trying to address here. The unity of knowledge in consilience. This is chapter four, the natural sciences. By any reasonable measure of achievement, the faith of the enlightenment thinkers in science was justified. Today, the greatest divide within humanity is not between races or religions, or even as widely believed between the literate and illiterate. It is the chasm that separates scientific from pre-scientific cultures. Without the instruments and accumulated knowledge of the natural sciences, physics, chemistry, and biology, humans are trapped in a cognitive prison. They are like intelligent fish, born in a deep, shadowed pool. Wondering and restless, longing to reach out, they think about the world outside. They invent ingenious speculations and myths about the origin of the confining waters of the sun and the sky and the stars above and the meaning of their own existence. But they are wrong, always wrong, because the world is too remote from ordinary experience to be merely imagined. Science is neither a philosophy nor a belief system. It is a combination of mental operations that has become increasingly the habit of educated peoples, a culture of illuminations hit upon by a fortunate turn of history that yield did the most effective way of learning about the real world ever conceived. With instrumental science, humanity has escaped confinement and prodigiously extended its grasp of physical reality. Once we were nearly blind, now we can see, literally. Visible light, we have learned, is not the sole illuminating energy of the universe, as pre-scientific common sense decreed. It is instead an infinitesimal sliver of electromagnetic radiation comprising wavelengths from 400 to 700 nanometers. It's a billionth of a meter within a spectrum that ranges from gamma waves trillions of times shorter to radio waves trillions of times longer. Radiation over most of this span in wildly varying amounts continually rains down on our bodies, but without instruments we were oblivious to its existence. Because the human retina is rigged to report only 400 to 700 nanometers, the unaided brain concludes that only visible light exists. Many kinds of animals know better. They live in a different visual world, oblivious to the part of the human visible spectrum, sensitive to some wavelengths outside it. Below 400 nanometers, butterflies find flowers and pinpoint pollen and nectar sources by the pattern of ultraviolet rays reflected off the petals. Where we see a plain yellow or white blossom, they see spots and concentric circles in light and dark. The patterns have evolved in plants to guide insect pollinators to the anthers and nectar pools. With the aid of appropriate instruments, we can now view the world with butterfly eyes. Scientists have entered the visual world of animals and beyond because they understand the electromagnetic spectrum. They can translate any wavelength into visible light and audible sound and generate most of the spectrum from diverse energy sources. By manipulating selected segments of the electromagnetic spectrum, they peer downward to the trajectories of subatomic particles and outward to star birth and distant galaxies whose incoming light dates back to near the beginning of the universe. They, more accurately we, since scientific knowledge is universally available, can visualize matter across 37 orders of magnitude. The largest galactic cluster is larger than the smallest known particle by a factor of the number one with about 37 zeros following it. I mean no disrespect when I say that pre-scientific people, regardless of their innate genius, 
could never guess the nature of physical reality beyond the tiny sphere attainable by unaided common sense. Nothing else ever worked. No exercise from myth, revelation, art, trance, or any other conceivable means. And notwithstanding the emotional satisfaction it gives mysticism, the strongest pre-scientific probe into the unknown has yielded zero. No shaman's spell or fast upon a sacred mountain can summon the electromagnetic spectrum. Prophets of the great religions were kept unaware of its existence, not because of a secretive God, but because they lacked the hard-won knowledge of physics. Is this a paean to the God of science? No, to human ingenuity, to the capacity in all of us, freed at last in the modern era, and to the fortunate comprehensibility of the universe. The signature achievement of humanity has been to find its way without assistance through a world that proved surprisingly well-ordered. All our other senses have been expanded by science. Once we were deaf, now we can hear everything. The human auditory range is 20 to 20,000 hertz, or cycles of air compression per second. Above that range, flying bats broadcast ultrasonic pulses into the night air and listen for echoes to locate moths and other insects on the wing. Many of their potential prey listen with ears tuned to the same frequencies as the bats. When they hear the telltale pulses, they dip and wheel in evasive maneuvers or else power dive to the ground. Before the 1950s, zoologists were unaware of this nocturnal contest. Now, with receivers, transformers, and nighttime photography, they can follow every squeak and aerial roll out. We have even uncovered basic senses entirely outside the human repertory, where humans detect electricity only indirectly by a tingling of skin or flash of light. The electric fishes of Africa and South America, a medley of freshwater eels, catfish, and elephant-nosed fishes, live in a galvanic world. They generate charged fields around their bodies with trunk muscle tissue that has been modified by evolution into organic batteries. The power is controlled by a neural switch. Each time the switch turns on the field, individual fish sense the resulting power with electroreceptors distributed over their bodies. Perturbations caused by nearby objects, which cast electric shadows over the receptors, allow them to judge size, shape, and movement. Thus continuously informed, the fish glide smoothly past obstacles in dark water, escape from enemies, and target prey. They also communicate with one another by means of coded electrical bursts. Zoologists, using generators and detectors, can join the conversation. They are able to talk as through a fish's skin. From these and countless other examples can be drawn an informal rule of biological evolution important to the understanding of the human condition. If an organic sensor can be imagined that picks up any signal from the environment, there exists a species somewhere that possesses it. The bountiful powers of life expressed in such diversity raise a question about the incapacity of the unaided human senses. Why can't our species, the supposed summum bonum of creation, do as much as all the animals combined and more? Why were we brought into the world physically handicapped? Evolutionary biology offers a simple answer, natural selection, defined as the differential survival and reproduction of different genetic forms, prepares organisms only for necessities. Biological capacity evolves into it, maximizes the fitness of organisms for the niches they fill. Biological capacity evolves until it maximizes the fitness of organisms for the niches they fill, and not a squiggle more. Every species, every kind of butterfly, bat, fish, and primate, including Homo sapiens, occupies a distinctive niche. It follows that each species lives in its own sensory world. In shaping that world, natural selection is guided solely by the conditions of past history, by events occurring moment to moment, then and now. Because moths are too small and indigestible to be energetically efficient food for large primates, Homo sapiens never evolved echolocation to catch them. And since we do not live in dark water, 
an electrical sense was never an option for our species. Natural selection, in short, does not anticipate future needs. But this principle, while explaining so much so well, presents a difficulty. If the principle is universally true, how did natural selection prepare the mind for civilization before civilization existed? That is the great mystery of human evolution, how to account for calculus and Mozart. Later, I will attempt an answer by expanding the evolutionary explanation to embrace culture and technological innovation. For the moment, let me soften the problem somewhat by addressing the peculiar nature of the natural sciences as a product of history. Three preconditions, three strokes of luck in the evolutionary arena led to the scientific revolution. The first was the boundless curiosity and creative drive of the best minds. The second was the inborn power to abstract the essential qualities of the universe. This ability was possessed by our Neolithic ancestors, but again, here the primary puzzle, seemingly developed beyond their survival needs. In just three centuries, from 1600 to 1900, too short a time for improvement of the human brain by genetic evolution, humankind launched the techno-scientific age. The third enabling precondition is that the physicist Eugene Wigner once called the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in the natural sciences. For reasons that remain elusive to scientists and philosophers alike, the correspondence of mathematical theory and experimental data in physics, in particular, is uncannily close. It is so close as to compel the belief that mathematics is in some deep sense the natural language of science. Wigner wrote, quote, the enormous usefulness of mathematics in the natural sciences is something bordering on the mysterious and there is no rational explanation for it. It is not at all natural that laws of nature exist, much less that man is able to discover them. The miracle of the appropriateness of the language of the mathematics of mathematics for the formulation of the laws of physics is a wonderful gift which we neither understand nor deserve. Close quote. Wigner. <laughs> Eugene Wigner, physicist. No, we don't deserve it, huh? There's that Christian. Why? We're all sinners. <clears throat> Forgive me. No one's watching these anyway. This is the 13th minute of chapter four. It'll never get a viewer. There'll be no people who see this moment. So I'm talking to the future long after I'm dead in the dream that you exist, that I've had since I was a kid. You're a student in the future, and I'm long gone. And you found out about me somehow, and you decided to dig, and you found these things. Thank you. It is no small thing for me that you exist. For I'll never know it. Which is why I cannot love you. Because you will not exist while I'm alive. But thank you. So yes, Wigner all into mathematics as a language for physics. Let's return to Professor uh, Wilson's narrative. The laws of physics are in fact so accurate as to transcend cultural differences. They boil down to mathematical formulae. They cannot be given Chinese or Ethiopian or Mayan nuances, nor do they cut any slack for masculinist or feminist variations. We may even reasonably suppose that any advanced extraterrestrial civilizations, if they possess nuclear power and can launch spacecraft, have discovered the same laws such that their physics could be translated isomorphically point to point, set to point, and point to set into human notation. The greatest exactitude of all has been obtained in measurements of the electron. A single electron is almost unimaginably small. Abstracted into a probabilistic packet of wave energy, it is also nearly impossible to visualize, as is the case generally for phenomena in quantum physics. Within the conventional cognitive framework of objects moving in three-dimensional space, 
Yet we know with confidence that it has a negative charge of 0 0.16 billion billionth. That's negative 1.6 times 10 to the 19th coulomb. And a rest mass of 0 0.91 billion billionth. That's 9.1 times 10 to the negative 28th gram. From these and other verifiable quantities have been accurately deduced. The properties of electric currents, the electromagnetic spectrum, the photoelectric effect, and chemical bonding. This book is filled with typos. In 1998, whoever proofread this book failed. I don't know if they weren't a scientist, but that sentence is totally wrong. Again, this has happened several times. I've been making corrections as I go, by the way. <laughs> okay. From these and other verifiable quantities have been accurately deduced the properties of electric currents, the electromagnetic spectrum, the photoelectric effect, and chemical bonding. The theory that unites such basic phenomena is an interlocking set of graphical representations and equations called quantum electrodynamics, QED. QED treats the position and momentum of each electron as both a wave function and a discrete particle in space. The electron is further envisioned in QED as randomly emitting and reabsorbing photons. The unique massless particles that carry the electromagnetic force. In one property of the electron, its magnetic moment theory and experiment have been matched to the most extreme degree ever achieved in the physical sciences. The magnetic moment is a, me is a measure of the interaction between an electron and a magnetic field. More precisely, it is the maximum torque experienced by the electron divided by the magnetic induction acting on it. The quantity of interest is the gyromagnetic ratio. That's the uh, magnetic moment, a measure of the interaction between an electron and a magnetic field. It is the maximum torque experienced by the electron divided by the magnetic, magnetic induction acting on it. Uh, the quantity is called the gyromagnetic ratio, the magnetic moment divided in turn by the angular momentum. Theoretical physicists predicted the value of the gyromagnetic ratio, gyromagnetic ratio with calculations incorporating both special relativity and perturbations from photon emission and resorption. The two phenomena expected from QED to cause small deviations from the ratio previously predicted by classical atomic physics. For their part, and independently, atomic scientists directly measured the gyromagnetic ratio. In a technical tour de force, they trapped single electrons inside a magnetic electric bottle and studied them for long periods of time. Their data matched the theoretical prediction to one part in a hundred billion. Together, the theoretical and experimental physicists accomplished the, the equivalence of launching a needle due east from San Francisco and correctly calling in advance where it would strike near Washington, D.C. to within the width of a human hair. The descent into minutissima, the search for ultimate smallness in entities such as electrons, is a driving impulse of Western natural science. It is a kind of instinct. Human beings are obsessed with building blocks, forever pulling them apart and putting them back together again. The impulse goes as far back as 400 BC to the first proto-science, when Leucippus and his student Democritus speculated, correctly as it turned out, that matter is made of atoms. Reduction to microscopic units has been richly consummated in modern science. The search for the ultimate has been aided through direct visual observation by steady advances in the resolving power of microscopes. This technological enterprise satisfies, satisfies a second elemental craving that we have, he says, to see all the world with our own eyes. The most powerful modern of modern instruments invented during the 1980s are the scanning, tunneling microscope and atomic force microscope, which provide an almost literal view of atoms bonded into molecules. A DNA double helix can now be viewed exactly as it is, including every twist and turn into which a particular molecule fell as the technician prepared it for study.
Had such visual techniques existed 50 years ago, the infant science of molecular biology would have escalated even more sharply than it has. In science, as in whist and bridge, one peak is worth a hundred finesses. Atomic level imaging is the end product of three centuries of technological innovation in search of the final peak. <laughs> Atomic level imaging is the end product of three centuries of technological innovation in search of the final peak. Microscopy began with the primitive optical instruments of Anton von Leeuwenhoek, which in the late 1600s, late 1600s, revealed bacteria and other objects a hundred times smaller than the resolution of the human eye. It has arrived at methods for showing objects a million times smaller. The passion for dissecting and reassembling has resulted in the invention of nanotechnology, the manufacture of devices composed of a relatively small number of molecules. Among the more impressive recent achievements are, now this is in 1998, nanotech in 1998, a etching stainless steel pins with ion beams. Bruce Lamartine and Roger Stutz of the Los Alamos National Laboratory have uh, created high density ROMs, read only memories, whose lines are cut so fine down to 150 billionths of a meter as to allow the storage of two gigabytes of data on a pin 25 millimeters long and one millimeter wide. Since the materials are non-magnetic, the information thus stored is nearly indestructible. Yet there is still a long way to go. In theory, at least, atoms can be ordered to store knowledge. B, a fundamental question in chemistry since the work of Lavoisier in the 18th century has been the following. How long does it take a pair of molecules to meet and bond when different reagents are mixed together? By confining solutions to extremely small spaces, Mark Whiteman and his fellow researchers at the University of Cal North Carolina observed flashes of light that mark the contact of oppositely charged reagent molecules, enabling the chemists to time the reactions with unprecedented accuracy. And see, molecule-sized machines that assemble themselves under the direction of technicians have for many years been considered a theoretical possibility. Now the ensembles are being realized in practice. One of the most promising techniques engineered by George M. Whitesides of Harvard and other organic chemis chemists consists in self-assembled monolayers. The SAMs, for short, consist of sausage-shaped molecules such as long hydrocarbon chains called alkanethials. After synthesis in the laboratory, the substances are painted onto a gold surface. One end of each molecule has properties that cause it to adhere to the gold. The other end, built of atoms with different properties, projects outward into space. Thus lined up like soldiers on parade, the molecules of the same kind create a single layer, only one to two nanometers thick. Molecules of a different construction are next laid down to create a second layer on top of the first, and so on, compound by compound, to produce a stratified film of desired thickness and chemical properties. SAMs share some of the basic properties of membranes of living cells. Their construction suggests one possible step in the eventual assembly of simple artificial organisms. Although far from being alive, SAMs are simula simulacra of elemental pieces of life. Given enough such components assembled the right way, chemists may someday produce a passable living cell. <laughs> The intellectual thrust of modern science and its significance for the consilient worldview can be summarized as follows. In the ultimate sense, our brain and sensory system evolved as a biological apparatus to preserve and multiply human genes. But they enable us to navigate only through the tiny segment of the physical world whose mastery serves that primal need. Instrumental science has removed the handicap. Still, science in its fullness is much more than just the haphazard expansion of sensory capacity by instruments. The other elements in its creative mix are classification of data and their interpretation by theory. Together, they compose the rational processing of sensory experience, enhanced by instrumentation. Nothing in science, nothing in life for that matter, makes sense without theory. 
It is our nature to put all knowledge into context in order to tell a story and to recreate the world by this means. So let us visit the topic of theory for a moment. All right, we're going to take a pause there. Um, this is The Natural Sciences, Chapter 4 of Consilience. And that'll be Part 1. And we're going to pick up with uh, his discussion on theory when we return next time. I'm MTK on the MIC.